Thank you very much. Thank you, organizers, for bringing me here. Although this will be some theory, uh, my motivation here is really practical. I started some years ago as a theater practitioner, uh, theater director, uh, <clears throat> spending most of the, uh, of the time sitting with, with colleagues in, in some cafe in the theater and co constantly complaining about cultural policy, about this or that. Uh, not being, not being good, uh, not not being tailored to our uh, our pr uh, practical needs, and uh, eventually I, I I got fed up with that sort of sitting in a cafe and <coughs> constantly complaining about cultural policy, so I decided uh, to take some sort of responsibility. To I said, oh, I thought it it will be very brief experience. I thought it will be uh, I will be like organizer in some sort of theater for several years, then, then come back to my, to my work. Uh, but soon I realized that you cannot change any single detail in theater policy if you don't go in, a, in overall cultural policy. And that you cannot change a single detail in, in cultural policy if you don't go in very much details of general, uh, general po uh, politics. So that took me took me really years to uh, to uh, learn the vocabulary of political work of political struggle. It took me years of learning of political economy, uh, and uh, I still don't have an answer. Uh, what will be uh, what will be the go good cultural policy? Uh, but let's let's try. Let's try. Uh, my aim here is to present normative framework of redistribution and recognition as developed uh, by Nancy Fraser, American philosopher. Uh, but before that, allow me, allow me to attempt to outline just briefly certain historical stages of development of cultural policy uh, last 60 years. Start the presentation, please. Uh, never mind. Uh, uh, I apologize. This is very schematic and uh, and really open for dispute, uh, especially the years uh, or, uh, on demarcation, demarcation of these stages. Uh, of course, we start with 1945, uh, post uh, uh, post World War uh, II period is sometimes considered idealist. Uh, because it's straightforward dedication to improve human capacities. Uh, after all atrocities of the war, who would object to the idea of cultivating a new man? And what could be better fit for that purpose than our arts and culture? Rationality of cultural policy uh, then was the result of interaction between two elements, basically. One was the ethos of state welfareism, built uh, on wartime solidarity between social classes. You know, every, every, everyone uh, practically fought together. They were, they were together in these shelters in London and so on. Uh, uh, it was built on developmental uh, proposals of liberal intellectuals of that time, like Keynes and Beveridge. Uh, uh, and of course, it was built on political platform of the, uh, of the left. The model uh, predecessors were public educators, uh, uh, such as uh, such as those uh, from the French Popular Front, with their with their redistributive policies. For example, paid vacations for the workers they introduced at the end of the 30s. The other element of post-war uh, cultural policies rationality was, in essence, the culture of the leisure upper middle class. That is why it, uh, it is high culture. Culture in, in capitalism is one of the good things that the upper classes have traditionally enjoyed, and that was the time to make it well, available to everyone. So the traditional conception of high culture persisted, uh, but now with some sort of state validation within the story that it was for all of us, for all people. The culture of an upper middle class was 
proclaimed as universal. Uh, that stage, uh, for that reason, that stage is oft often associated with the cultural paternalism. Uh, you are familiar with that terminology, uh, I suppose. On the level of uh, governmental technologies, it was the fair period of foundation of uh, cultural institutions, infrastructure like arts councils, libraries, sport associations, national parks, uh, decentralized theaters, and so on. Building an, an institutional ensemble to cultivate, preserve, and bring the best to the most which was probably the most precise slogan of cultural policy of that time. The best, of course, was the heritage and inheritance of authors mostly dead by that time. So the strategic actors of that first stage of Fordist era cultural, of cultural policy, uh, policy were performers of their work. Uh, performers were, in essence, main benefactors of, of, of that cultural policy. Socialist Croatia in Yugoslavia uh, developed, of course, a slightly different path. Uh, in Vjeran Katunaric's account, trying to develop idealistic socialist culture to counteract the bourgeois high culture, it reaches for the canons of socialist real realism, but leaves the artists and the performers to a certain extent privileged. privileged. Uh, labor unions, uh, free from class struggle, take on a new role of bringing the culture to the industrial, industrial shop, shop floor through factory libraries, social evenings, excursions, organize, organized collective visits to the theater and so on. It aimed at democratization, uh, but the result was probably as paternalistic uh, as, for instance, in Britain, where cultural policy of the time, Raymond Williams, <laughs> described as leading the unenlightened to the particular kind of light which the leaders find satisfactory for themselves. So uh, later, later uh, be beginning of 60s, it was, it was more sophisticated in terms of the uh, uh, of uh, this, the, the, the creators of this cultural policy uh, uh, basic aims. Uh, the, hegemon the hegemony of enlightened pater paternalism was eventually, some, sometime during that period or even before, challenged in the name of class or ethnically, ethnically based cultural expression or activity outside the mainstream. The notion of excellence as primary policy focus uh, was called in question. The working classes were not satisfied with the role of passive audiences anymore. Uh, they wanted, uh, they wanted uh, what we call today an active participation. It is a, uh, it is a dawning of an era of uh, empowering communities, self-realization, realization, and cultural democracy discourse. Uh, thus, uh, uh, 1976 Council of Europe report on Social, social cultural animation advocate, advocated that the purpose of cultural policy should be promotion among the mass of the people of active use and development of their native culture, of their culture, of experience and practice of the art according to their own conception, not some, some higher conception of, of high middle class, and the evolution of lifestyles of their own choice. So that was a refining, basically, of, of post-war cultural policy. Basically, if you, if you throw out uh, uh, the bourgeois high culture and socialist realism here from the previous stage, you get social democratic cultural policy of the major post-Fordist era uh, uh, or developing self-managed socialism here. Uh, in his speech to the Writers Association Congress, uh, 1952 in Ljubljana, influential writer Miroslav Krleža set socialist literature free of socialist realism. Its task is to continue the tradition of those who defend the freedom of artistic expression, expression, pluralism of styles, and freedom of ethical and political speech, said Krleža. It was the signal that it was over with the party art and literature. 
the leftists the leftist so, uh, sort of popular, uh, French popular front conception of emancipation of the lower strata through education gains, gains full legitimation here. From that arose uh, the soci social cultural motive, so-called, or social instrumentalist approach. Uh, the target of cultural policies is not only the work of art, but the population. In Foucault's termino terminology, such biopolitical task includes, includes to get estranged people to communicate again, to rebuild the depopulated de communities and so on. Uh, culture and everyday, uh, and everyday life were no longer seen as, as uh, in, in opposition to one another, but as identical. Breaking the monopolies of elites and uh, rationality of decentralization and, as, as Bourdieu would say, expansion of cultural capital, technically required new actors, com uh, community, community arts workers, recreation planners, facilitators, and with time, cultural policy works. So at this stage, cultural policy was professionalized. Uh, I apologize again for, for being so uh, schematic, but uh, this is the time also uh, uh, when the freedom of expression, culture and arts uh, were used uh, uh, as the instrument of the Cold War. Uh, the, culture painted, uh, the culture painted picture of pluralism, of good life, uh, uh, of our example uh, to the world and was exported or imported. Uh, since a variety of uh, dis uh, discursive perspectives, idealist, uh, materialist, bicultural, multicultural, professional, amateur, had to be reconciled, new conceptual framework uh, had to be found to offer a unifying, unifying policy rationale and enters the concept of the cultural dim uh, dimension of development promoted by UNESCO from 1970s. Cultural development uh, uh, was seen as primary agenda to which economic policy would be subservient. Uh, the culture was the like, main goal of, of the humanity, of course. Uh, cultural development was intended to become both goal and the process both mean and an end. Everyone familiar with the work of Vieran Katonaric knows about that, I guess. The, the period up, up till now is all often described as Fordist, uh, after the political economic model it rested upon. It was characterized uh, by mass industrial employment, we know, rising real wages and mass consumption. In, uh, in the developed, uh, developed countries, the Fordist paradigm uh, directed political claims into the redistribution uh, channels of the national welfare state, where recognition problems, identity issues, if existed, were really secondary, and, uh, and everyone considered them as, uh, 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 as subtext of, of, of distributive uh, uh, problems. Meanwhile, in, in our parallel universe, communism uh, had uh, affected similar containment of recognition in, in, in the second world. In the third world, finally, at the points of departure for present day mass migrations, some countries uh, had established so-called developmental states in which distribu distributive concerns also had priority. Well, Post-Fordism and post-communism put an end to that project. It was officially over with the economic crisis of the 70s, thereby, in, thereby intensifying struggles for status, uh, status and, and recognition, especially around race, religion and ethnicity, then over gender and sexuality. The result has been amplified, moreover, by the accompanying dynamics of, of neoliberal uh, global, globalization over the next period. Uh, when we come to, the mar to that market phase, uh, 
rather brief, rather brief that, the, that the previous moment of hegemony of cultural development was also the start of its decay. It was due to the failure of welfare, welfare capitalist assumption on which it generally rested. Gains of rising producti productivity were not meant to be shared between the labor and the capital anymore. The change of the political economy stipulated the fundamental change in cultural power relation. The transition from Fordist economies to poor Fordist enterprise economies, or for that matter, from market socialism to uh, market capitalism, uh, bore a considerable cultural impact. Uh, this transition is dis described in some periodization in terms of two stages as reaction uh, and incorporation uh, of the cultural policy. Uh, uh, this is because the, the discursive strategies that provide policy justification dif may differ signific significantly. Uh, uh, but arguably, it, it, it may be more accurate to conceive uh, of this development not as separate per period. As periods, uh, oh, please, can we go back? Uh, uh, but as as linked as linked uh, uh, phases in the cultural consolidation of the of the post-Fordist neoliberal state. Again, very brief and schematic. Uh, cost of the Cold War and Vietnam War and slow economic growth provoked the changes in American, monitor, American, American monetary policy at the beginning of the 70s. That in turn caused nearly 400% increase of price of oil. Since US dollar is the currency for international transaction and transport, oil uh, makes part of vir virtually any other price the stag stagflation crisis spread over the world. Developmental uh, Keynesian economics uh, went out of fashion. Previously insignificant, neoliberal economists got an ear of the politician. They eventually convinced them that investments and growth could rise again if they abolished controls of movement of, for movement of capital over the national borders. Despre desperate for the end of crisis and return, return to the better nego negotiation position, even labor union leaders accepted that. Unfortunate for them and their members, it was just to get to know that they don't have any negotiation position anymore. Any wage-related union request is soon to be met with a, with a threat from the owners of capital to move it across the border. To move it uh, where our political climate has eventually changed, and the labor force is cheap. So the new discourse of competitiveness was born. Uh, lower strata was left out of equation, sentenced to compete with the price of its labor, labor force, nothing else. But the new middle classes, uh, which formed within the previous period of welfare state, uh, felt invited to compete with their individual performances, with their cultural capital, acquired by education, by distinction of taste, for the products of high culture, but also material consumption, like eating out, like tourism, you know. Uh, however, uh, in the case of, uh, of non-material consumption, new middle class had the role of both as provider, uh, creative worker, and consumer of uh, of activities supported by public funds. In, in both functions, uh, uh, the members of the new middle class, so-called baby boomers, my parents, for example, uh, they were the main beneficiaries. So basically, instead, uh, amateur orchestra participation or free of charge visit to the theater uh, with uh, uh, his or her co-workers, uh, people had uh, distinctive interests and, 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 and tastes. That, of course, created sort of market competition between artistic producers and soon developed new criteria of excellence uh, and funding. But the market criteria or, uh, of profit, or at least sustainability, started to matter not only for the arts, uh, 
but for the whole field of cultural policy and, and, and its institutional infrastructure. It's spread all over the place. That new rationality of so-called new public management entails that even government's policies need to be measured uh, on the points of input and output according to the economic effectiveness. So that's how we learn that new language of criteria, indicators, reports, uh, evaluators of public spending uh, uh, soon to be severely cut, of course. In his periodization account, uh, Belaraski notes that it was the time when Minister of Culture began to argue that a welfare state mentality had developed in arts and culture sector inviting the members of the new cultural management and arts administrators to see themselves more and more as uh, business executives. Uh, they had basically two strategies at their, hand, at their hand. One is to outsource, of course, contracting out the programs and services to private providers. You don't, you don't need to care about profitability. Uh, you know, you know probably m much about that mixed economy of culture. But the other strategy uh, is to defend the remains of spending with the argument about uh, so-called multiplier effect. Uh, you know, you know about uh, you know about that uh, spillover effects. In indirect profitability of investment in, in arts and culture. Uh, terminology of summer festivals, uh, uh, innovation, location, and comparative ad advantage that goes neatly with uh, urban regen regeneration and so on. So this course of local culture and identity as specific advantage uh, associated uh, with certain location where to invest capital or spend income on leisure activities uh, is very interesting here. Uh, over the next period, when post-socialists and the third world countries joined full force, it will develop into narratives encompassing whole states struggling for their five minutes of recognition in the market of neoliberal globalization. Beginning of the last decade, when Council of Europe commissioned its study on cultural policy and cultural diversity, it was sociolo uh, sociologist Tony Bennett to warn that artistic and cultural landscape needs to evolve to reflect the realities of the new globalized, uh, globalized planet. Uh, in its broader meaning, the study said, the promotion of cultural diversity involves supporting the right to be different of all those who, in one way or another, can be, have been placed outside dominant social and cultural norms. Disabled people, gays and lesbians, women, the older, as, as well as immigrant or in, indigenous groups, and even the poor. Uh, but the study immediately added that the focus is on uh, ethnically marked cultural differences associated with the international movement of peoples. Uh, it was very early, so, so uh, it was uh, exactly beginning of the, of the last decade. It was published in 2001. In the, uh, some, some years later, in the UNESCO's 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of Diversity of Cultural Expressions, that main convention, uh, uh, that universally humanitarian and participatory, uh, participatory aspect of cultural differences among group is, groups is still present, but the focus shifted to go goods and services of the markets. To diversity of cultural expressions, visual arts, music, heritage and traditions, crafts, cinema and theater. Such strategy, such strategy made some critics, such as Piconen, to develop the understanding of that UNESCO's interpretation of cultural diversity as interplay of three discourses of governmentalization, that incorporation of cultural policies, commodification and democratization, of course. 
as diversity becomes a cornerstone of, in the bus business world, quotes Pikonen, uh, cultural diversity must thus be considered as an asset whose added value is coming to be recognized in more and more areas of economic development. So this, this is the exact words of UNESCO's World Report from 2009. Sure, there is also a discourse which aims at making the world better, of course, in terms of uh, communicative democracy, participation, equality, and empowerment. To some extent, uh, it is a progressive counter discourse, concludes Piconan. But in general, then, we are confronted with a new constellation. The end of communism, the rise, to, rise of free market ideology, the rise of identity politics uh, in both uh, its fundamentalist and progressive forms. All these developments have joined to silence the claims for egalitarian redistribution, for equality between social classes. So, we, we, we remember basically uh, historically two types of claims for social justice. First and most familiar are redistributive claims, which seek for a more just distribution of resources and wealth. Today, however, we increasingly encounter a, a second type of social justice, claim uh, in the politics of recognition. Here, the goal uh, in its most plausible form is a difference-friendly world. In this new constellation, the two kinds of justice claims are, all, are often dissociated from one another. This situation exemplifies a broader phenomenon, the widespread decoupling of cultural politics and social politics, of the politics of difference from the politics of equality. In some cases, we are effectively presented with either or choice, redistribution or recognition. Class politics or identity politics, multiculturalism or democratic socialism. Uh, these, uh, Nancy Fraser insists, are false, false antithesis. Uh, justice today requires both redistribution and recognition. Neither alone is sufficient. And she is convinced that both claims could be integrated within a single framework. Uh, you know, Professor, let's roll the film as an example of, 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 of for, the, for that. My first Pride March was in 1974 and it was very different to Pride Marches as they are these days. It was flanked by a double row of policemen either side and we knew damn well they were not there to look after us. These were the days when people were bad, sad and mad. We were mad because we were classified by the World Health Organization. My first Pride March was in 1974 and it was very different to Pride Marches as they are these days. It was flanked by a double row of policemen either side and we knew damn well they were not there to look after us. These were the days when people were bad, sad and mad. We were mad because we were classified by the World Health Organization and lots of medical authorities around the world as suffering from mental illness. Sad because we were all seen as kind of lonely and bad because we were seen as being moral degenerates. That's quite a lot to contend with really that you're being told all these things and I was one of the victims of that and so discovering that Actually, there wasn't anything wrong with this. It was an amazing thing for me. Not only was there nothing wrong with me, but the thing that was wrong was a thing called homophobia. I turned from being this very sad, depressed teenager into this really, really angry young man, but also at the same time really, really, really happy. <laughs> and the whole world had to know I was gay from then on. Because I'd learned that concept of being oppressed,
suddenly everybody else's oppression seemed to make sense to me. I then started to look at that world that way and then started to feel some kind of affinity from other groups besides my own, as it were. June 1984, an old friend of mine bumped into me in the street and said, Hi Mike, how about collecting for the miners for the Gay Pride March? And I said, yeah, good idea. We went along to the march and we were quite astonished really how much support that we got. People were generous, not just in the financial donations, but also quite how angry people were with the Thatcher government. Unemployment was shooting up, the unions were being bashed. Now when we did that, we were fighting homophobia every day of our lives. We were used to it, we were likely to encounter homophobia. The miners weren't at the zeitgeist of, uh, of, of sexual politics. But what we were sure of is we supported them, we supported their strike, we felt that the strike was just. We also felt some common cause as well because we saw how uh, the striking miners during the strike were being vilified by the media, by the government. That had a lot of resonance for us as, as young gay men. Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. What we found time and time again was it would often be the first time that they'd actually spoken to an out gay man. And the number of times I found men in that situation, their homophobia would kind of dissolve almost instantly. I've had actually quite a lot of men in that situation at the end of the conversations apologising to me for the personal transgressions of the previous homophobia. What LGSM achieved really was this amazing solidarity with the miners. When we twinned with the mining community in South Wales, they would invite all the supporters to come down and spend a weekend with them. And so when we went down there, we were drinking our beers in the miners' welfare hall with them. They were directly asking us really personal questions because they wanted to get to know us. They also been told this homophobic nonsense. And of course, four or five hours later, and goodness knows how much beer later, we were no longer political comrades with the best of mates. And you know that solidarity still lasts to, to today. For years, lesbians and gay men have been banging on the door of the trade union movement and the Labour Party saying, listen to us, we're lesbians and gays, we want rights, we haven't got any rights. You know, people could be sacked for the jobs. Uh, lesbians would lose custody of their children because they were deemed to be unfit mothers simply because of their sexuality. What changed in 1985 was the National Union of Mine Workers, in tribute to the support that we given them during the strike, announced in advance that they were going to support the LGBT motion and because of that all the other industrial unions in homage to the striking miners fell in line so initially it was a trade union movement that adopted lesbians and gay rights and then in the fullness of time we had the return of a Labour government when that happened then things really started to move at pace legislation was passed literally giving legally recognized employment rights and then of course we got civil partnerships and then eventually gay marriage came in we also have to remain strong in remembering that those rights can be taken away from us. There's lots of extreme right-wing governments uh, coming into power, overturning LGBT equalities in, the, in their own countries, and there's lots of violence taking place. So we have to remain out and proud and visible, and we have to keep on banging that drum, because if we don't, we'll lose it. It's as simple as that. Acts of solidarity are so important that we reach outside our own community and instead of being introspective and living in a little LGBT bubble, reach out to other communities and say, we are you, I am you. You can't beat solidarity, it's the best feeling in the world. example of how redistribution and recognition can be reconciled. Um, to see why, Nancy Fraser invites us to engage in a sort of thought experiment. Imagine sort of spectrum of inequalities with clear redistributive divisions at one extreme, uh, here on the left, and division that, divisions that clearly fit the paradigm of recognition at the other. If you look at, any, uh, at an ideal, typical social division rooted in the economic structure, uh, structure of society, 
class division of the left, on the left, by definition, it is traceable to, to political economy. The core of injustice uh, is uh, economic problem, maldistribution uh, of resources, while any associated cultural injustice ultimately stem from that. Uh, so the remedy is, of course, uh, hard to come politically, uh, but at least clear. Redress the injustice with redistribution. An ide uh, ideal typical social division rooted in the economic structure of society is, of course, class, class inequality, as understood in orthodox economistic Marxism. Let's leave aside for now the question whether this interpretation of Marx's own work is appropriate. Uh, or whether, whether it fits really the historical struggles in the name of the working class. But on the other, on the, on the, on the other end of that conceptual spectrum of Nancy Fraser, let's consider an ideal typical social division that fixed, uh, fits the paradigm of recognition. An example that, appear, uh, that appears appropriate is sexual differentiation between heterosexuals and homosexuals. It is not grounded in political economy as homosexuals are distributed to the entire class structure of capitalist society. The division is rooted rather in the stat a status order of society. Uh, as institutionalized patterns of cultural va value construct heterosexuality as natural and normative, homosexuality as perverse and despised. Such, such value patterns infer, inform uh, many uh, areas of law, of government policy, popular culture, and everyday interaction. Uh, and the effect is to con construct uh, gays and lesbians as a despised sexuality, subject to sexually specific forms of stat status subordination, shaming, and assault, exclusion from the rights and privileges of marriage and parenthood, attacks on rights of expression and association, stereotypical depictions in the media, harassment uh, in, everyday, uh, in everyday life, and denial of the full rights and equal protection of citizenship. These harms, of course, are injustices of misrecognition. To be sure, gays and lesbians also suffer serious economic injustices. They can be dismissed from civilian employment and military service uh, denied broad range of family-based social welfare benefits, face major tax and inheritance liabilities and so on. But far from being rooted directly in the economic structure of society, these derive instead from the, from the, from the status order, uh, from that Weberian perspective of how society is organized. The remedy for the injustice accordingly is recognition of sexual rights. Uh, not redistribution, change the relation of recognition, that is, uh, and the maldistribution mal will disappear. In general, then, overcoming homophobia and heterosexism requires changing the sexual status order, the uh, uh, institutionalizing heteronormative value patterns, and replacing them with patterns that express equal respect for gays and lesbians. Matters are thus socially bleak and gloomy, of course, uh, but fairly straightforward at the two extremes of our conceptual spectrum. At least we know what to do. If the policy objective is to improve position of social groups that approach the type of despised sexuality, then the appropriate response, uh, response will come from the range of cultural policies. And conversely, when we deal with groups similar to the ideal type of exploited working class, what is required is redistributive remedy. Leaving aside the question what may resolve the core of injustice, uh, or simply redress its surface. One may think of changing the ownership patterns in society or anything from the wide range of redistributive social and fiscal remedies. I don't imply that cultural policy actions are completely inappropriate here. Uh, on the contrary, at this end of conceptual spectrum, cultural policies may serve as modest efforts to make the problem socially visible. <laughs> 
for the start, sort of solutions that will help us to develop solutions. But maybe we can address that later. Because matters become murkier, however, once we move away from these extremes. When we posit, uh, when we, uh, when we posit a type of social division located in the middle of conceptual spectrum, uh, we, we encounter a hybrid form that combines features of, of the exploited class with features of despised sexuality. Fraser calls such, division, uh, such divisions two-dimensional, rooted at once in the economic structure and the status order of society. They involve injustices that are traceable to both. Uh, Fraser's example includes troubles with gender, of course, as two-dimensional social inequality. Neither simply, neither simply a class, nor simply a status group. Gender is a, uh, gender is a hybrid category rooted simultaneously in the economic structure and, and, the, and the status order of society. Why is that? As social interpretation of sex, Gender serves as a basic organizing principle of the economic structure of capitalist society. Uh, a division between paid productive and unpaid reproduc uh, reproductive labor, no matter now does it fit exactly to Marx's concepts, uh, as well as division between male and female wages and occupations. So that's why gender is class-like division. From, uh, uh, but gender is, of course, uh, uh, status differenti differentiation as well. It has elements more reminiscent of uh, sexuality than class. Not just women, but uh, women, but all low status groups risk feminization, uh, feminization and thus depreciation. So gender explodes this whole series of false antithesis between different conceptions of injustice, contrasting remedies for, uh, remedies for these injustices, suffering subjectivities, and different interpretations of, of the inequalities and the differences between social groups. But the question is how in, unusual is gender in this regard? Race, it is clear, is also two-dimensional social division a mixture of status and class. In the economy, race differentiation between skilled and un unskilled, low-paid jobs and does uh, 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 form, form class-like divisions. The same goes for immigrants and ethnic minorities. They too suffer disproportionately high rates of unemployment and pover poverty uh, and over-representation over in low-paid. Uh, low-paid uh, uh, occupations. These distributive injustices can, can only be remedied, uh, remedied by policy, uh, policies of redistribution. But at the same time, Eurocentric value patterns of whiteness stig stigmatize everyone coded as black, brown, yellow, migrant, Croatian, or for that matter, when in Croatia, Serbian. Institution, institutionalized, these norms generate specific forms of st status subordination, including stigmatization, stigmatization and physical assault, cultural devaluation, social exclusion, political mar marginalization, harassment in everyday life, and denial of the full rights and equal protections of citizenship. Quintessential harms of misrecognition these injustices can only be remedied by polit politics, politics of recognition. So even such an apparently one-dimensional status category as sexuality has a distributive component. You know, economic risks of coming out, uh, maldistribution as, as possibly weak li link in heterosexism and so on. Even class, uh, and even class can be understood as two-dimensional. Uh, you know, status harms that uh, or originated as byproducts of economic structure may have, may have seen, since developed a sort of life of their own, on their own. And, and, and plus, to build broad support for economic transformation today will require challenging, uh, ch challenging cultural attitudes 
uh, towards work and working people in, in cultural terms. Likewise, poor and working people may need the recognition politics to support their struggles for economic justice. For practical purposes then, virtually all real world axes of subordination can be treated as two dimensional, involving both, both distributive and rec recognitive dynamics where each of those injustices has, has some independent weight, whatever it, its ultimate roots. Fraser, Fraser, Fraser use, uses the phrase uh, intersecting differentiation. For example, any, anyone who is both gay and working class will need both redistribution and recognition, of course. So, uh, what presents itself as the economy is always already impregnated with interpretations and norms. It's culturally in, in, in impregnated. Uh, likewise, what presents itself as the cultural sphere is deeply organized by the bottom line, uh, uh, by, by numbers in, in some economic reports. For example, global mass entertainment, art market, tran transnational advertising. All these are fundamental to cont contemporary culture, but these are really business activities. Treating every practice as simultaneously economic and cultural, not necessarily in equal proportions, proportions we must assess each of them from two different perspectives at the same time. We must assume both the standpoint of distribution and the standpoint of recognition without reducing either one of these perspectives to the other. Such an approach Nancy Fraser calls perspectival dualism. Behind it all rises the traditionally difficult but necessary to answer for, for ourselves question of uh, conception of capitalism. Is it a system that differentiates, uh, differentiates an economic order that is not directly regulated by the patterns of cultural value uh, from other social orders that are? Or should, or should the inequalities of capitalist economic order be, order be understood rather as a consequence of, of, of cultural inequalities? Fraser words here may sound a bit enigmatic, but the question really boils, boils down to this. May we assume that the economic inequality too is basically the outcome of the lack of someone's learning effort? Or at least lack of learning opportunities often associated with race, ethnicity, gender or migrant status? If the answer is yes, then practically all social problems may be resolved with appropriate developmental cultural policies. If the answer is yes, then our conceptions of capitalism, that is to say our political positions, may range from head-on neoliberalism of, as uh, Mike, uh, Michel Foucault would like to say, entrepreneurship of the self to the approval, to the to, uh, range from that position to the approval of public spending for social, so-called social investment in communities, improving the access of the subaltern to the features of mainstream life, to the books and the theater. But uh, our, our positions may range, but they will always stay confined to the so-called progressive spectrum. If the answer is no. If there is a certain um, structural coercion from one's class, economic position, well then, we'll probably need to accept that progressive cultural policies as agents of social change either need to be made part of wider politics of emancipation or choose to wither as a veneer, as a, as a mask clumsily glued over the surface of deep, deeper social imbalances. So if Fraser's normative framework I have offered here today has any validity, uh, 
It suggests that before uh, any new cultural policy succeeded, uh, the, the fundamental change will be required to the political economies of our states to build a hegemonic coalition of all, of all those exposed to any economic and cultural form, form of oppression. Thank you.